and uh, we'll, we'll get a microphone around and have a question time at the end. Um, we'll wait for the microphone please so that everybody can, can hear. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks Rob. Okay, I think I've turned the, the microphone on. Are you getting this? Yep, fabulous. Okay, thanks. Um, right, confession time. I rather like the title I obviously gave you a long, long, long time ago. Um, but I obviously didn't keep it. Um, so, uh, so yes, the content is uh, is as promised. But uh, anyway, you can do a straw poll at the end of the original title. Okay, there we go. Final element. Well, fantastic. Okay, um, right. Um, can't ask my mask to, to, to speak about my work, um, which I'm, I'm always very happy to do, but it's a little, little bit of a puzzle kind of because I work across a number of different areas. What I'm really sort of um, putting on today is um, I'm responsible for the program of Central Government Emergency Response Training, which has been described in the uh, in, in the slightly mysterious and exciting sounding place in the Cabinet Office briefing rooms of COBRA. Um, it, it, it's, it's neither mysterious nor, nor exciting. Um, but really what I want to, uh, to sort of cover is um, it's, it's about ambiguity, it's about uncertainty. Um, it's not about crisis decision making, it's not about you know, policing or, or anything dramatic and probably much more exciting than that. But really what I, I know you, you come from a, a variety of different professional backgrounds, some of which will involve, I know, um, crisis management, incident management, business continuity and, and, and the likes. And you, you might think, okay, well, I can see how that maps across. Um, but really what I'm just talking about is how any collection of people, when faced with a more or less common task or set of tasks, they actually make sense of that situation as, as a group. And the, the short answer to that is, is usually with difficulty, if at all. Um, so I really want to sort of expose the, the problem as we in, in, in central government in crisis um, machinery, as it were, uh, understand it and really what we, uh, what we do about it. Um, that's the uh, that's the sort of a hit list that I really want to uh, to run th run through. I'll canter through this at a reasonable uh, a reasonable pace. Um, it, it is you know inherent working in a crisis is inherently uh, uncertain. If, if you knew what was going on and what the implications might be, then it wouldn't be a crisis. So that's that's really sort of uh, no 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 avoiding it. Um, this idea of a common operating picture, or a COP, um, is, is, is often written about, it's often promoted and sold by commercial organisations. And they, they, you know, whether you're talking about sort of products or software design or whatever, there seems to me to be a whole bunch of assumptions about each one of those words, um, particularly about what actually is common. Human factors in the, your line of work will be very, very widely known uh, and familiar to you. I'll touch on those. But really where I want to end up is, um, is talking about situational awareness, which certainly in, in, in my line of work and context has become really a bit of a buzz uh, word in, in, in recent years. But like a lot of things that have suddenly sort of been lots of people using words, I'm not at all convinced that lots of people are using the words in the same way. There's a certain irony in that. Um, and really want to sort of talk about shared um, situational awareness. Okay, I've been using this slide for absolutely years, which really either suggests I've got no imagination, no update skills, or things are really not getting any better. But it's my sort of basic sort of problem of, uh, of working in a crisis. So in the vertical axis, we've got activity and demand, the, uh, the speed with which you have to do stuff in a crisis, but also the demand for information and, and, and on the horizontal axis, um, time. So that's your sort of, you could argue the shape of curves if, if, if you want. But broadly speaking, that's your demand for information. Uh, I, I said, yeah, you demand for information in the pace of, uh, of, of decision making. So really, really, really fast, and it kind of tails off over a long period of time. And of course, the problem here, the pig in the tent, if you will, is, is that the supply of reliable information lags some way behind it. So as I said, we could argue the shape of these things if, if, if we so wanted. Um, but of course, the gap between those two is, is characteristic of the crisis um, and the fundamental problem we're, we're facing here. Supply of reliable information as distinct from just any old stuff, um, which, uh, which uh, is, is really the problem in actual fact. So I'm responsible for training a lot of people across government at various, at various different grades and situation sales and decision support roles and decision making um, uh, roles. And one of the things that we're really trying to teach people to do is when you actually in a situation which is inherently uncertain, i.e. you don't know, 
then start to unpack that. Actually ask the questions of yourself, your colleagues, the situation, the information feeds you're actually getting, and just try and get a little bit of a handle on why you don't know. Really sort of try to, uh, to characterize the uncertainty that you are facing. And, and they usually sort of end up with, uh, with, with these as a whole bunch of, uh, of different answers. Too little information used to be the problem in crisis management. Nowadays with sort of, you know, um, social media and all of the rest of it, citizen journalism, um, much more sort of connected world, and too much information within which the good stuff, whatever you define that as, is lost. I, I don't wish to, uh, to, to, to go through these, but, um, but all of these are, are things that we've been very much sort of caught on, on the horns of in, 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 in managing crises. Um, conflicts with, uh, between different sorts of sources are absolutely, abs absolutely normal, and things that are out of sequence with me and, uh, and, and all of the rest of it. So actually getting people to actually think, why do I not know what is going on, is a very useful first discipline. I work in a bureaucracy, um, no, uh, no shame in admitting that, I'm sure many of you do uh, as well of, of, of a variety of different types. And, 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 and I imagine that you have got some form of process, structure and process and ways of working for managing information that looks something, oh my, I'm go, what, is that me hitting my mic, sorry. Um, uh, and broadly speaking, is, you know, we need some information, we find some information, we do something with it to satisfy ourselves that we've got broadly the right kind of thing. We, we analyse it in some way, we add some value to it, we tell people about it in a form that's actually uh, you know, uh, supporting the, 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 the challenges that they have, the decisions they've got to, uh, to, to, to face, and you close the loop with a bit of uh, recording and audit and all the rest of it. So I imagine you know, most decent sized bureaucracies have got something that looks broadly like that. But in the same way that a common operating picture, um, which is sold to us in a variety of different ways, um, has, uh, has got uh, a lot of assumptions embedded in it, um, there's a lot of assumptions about us all understanding what we are doing and what we're doing with other people and what it all means, embedded in any sort of diagram like that. And I think most of what is offered to us by commercial providers, some, some highly competent, very, very reputable and smart organisations amongst them, when they're, when they're trying to sell us a common operating picture, is broadly at that sort of dissemination, communication, end user. It is actually, you've done information management, you've done some analysis, it is actually displaying um, the, the, the results of, of, of that. So what are some of these common operating pictures that people, uh, that people um, uh, commercials offer us? Um, look like. Um, I've got a background in geospatial technology um, and the vast majority of them, if you just take the, uh, the charlatans well out, which I did, um, which is to go for Google search, then uh, they look uh, broadly, uh, broadly like uh, map-based outputs. Um, so clearly what they're doing is they're fusing information on the majority of that sort of, uh, that sort of cycle of uh, information management and then pop, let's just go with that word, like that word, pop the results on a map. Some are more complex than others. Some of the uh, some of the, sort of the offerings out there um, are a bit more sort of systemy, um, and they offer they sort of offer an insight into where you're pulling the data from and all of the rest of it. And I'm not quite sure what that one means, but it gives a sense of complexity. Lots of information, lots of people, lots of doing some work, and haul it all together, tie it up, pop it on a map. And that works very well. Very, very well in certain sorts of contexts where the conditions for common understanding are very, very strong. So in the Victory Club, lots of people that sort of, you know, we can all imagine from a military context, my boss the last 10 years has been a uh, retired Major General. We've been on a very interesting journey, or well, I found it interesting, um, about what constitutes um, interoperability, the ability of organizations and people within them to work effectively together as a matter of course. For him, when we first started working together on this day one of his civilian life, it was my tank talking to your helicopter. That was it. There's no human component. It was purely data transfer. It was very, very, very technical. My route into this will be working in post-conflict um, uh, reconstruction environments in places like Mozambique, Rwanda, and Sudan, where the, the technical infrastructure was absolutely the least of our problems. It was about actually getting um, organ organizations and collectors coming from a totally a very, very wide variety of different kinds of backgrounds using very different languages, both literally in terms of technical language, to fuse all of that together to reach one view, one version, of what is actually happening. The technical stuff was piece of cake, dead easy, because it was very simple. 
but actually the human factors component of that, getting people to work effectively together, was really, really difficult. So you can see there's, there's some interest, so there was for me, in somebody for them that's all about technology, for somebody who's all about the human factors, actually sort of uh, working out what it meant in, uh, in the civilian world. So certainly that's, that's an, if you look at it in the context of crisis management here in the UK, whether you're in uh, a big private sector organisation, public sector, or working as is increasingly normal across the two, then cross-boundary working is absolutely normal. But it is at boundaries when the wheels start to wobble. Um, I've, I've, I've sort of dot, dot, dotted, redacted out the, the name of the, uh, the, the software offering because I, I, I attach, um, I'm not being pejorative at all in, in, in picking this off. But I, I think the sort of the claims that are tacit and in some places explicit within this are quite interesting and really quite sort of bold. How easily and inexpensively um, the common operation picture can now be solved. That strikes me as quite a binary view of the world. You have a problem, you fix the problem, you no longer have a problem. Certainly, our experience of human factors is they are inherently and inescapably a problem. You, you can get better, but you never make it go away. So I'm nervous of the word solved in quite binary terms and is the key to making uh, everyone, everyone making better decisions. So these are really quite bold claims. Um, but of course, as you sort of get more and more sort of complex from sort of your individuals working, then the only person they've got to have a conversation with is, is themselves, to sort of small team working, where there's a lot of ta ta tacit knowledge, there's a lot of transactive memory, as, uh, as, uh, as, as psychologists would call it, into, uh, into multi-team systems or teams of teams. And you build many, many more, more links and boundaries that you're working across. And the kind of bold claims that are made um, by the commercials, I think, become more more and more dubious. Okay, I like the, there's nothing original in this, uh, in this uh, ripped off the internet image. But the, word, the, the term picnic is one that really sort of um, tickles me. And I've been talking about it for a number of years, so you may have heard it before. It was raised to me by, uh, by a good friend of mine who's, um, who's, uh, who's much more important than me. He's got an outer office and all sorts of, uh, all sorts of posh things like that. And his computer went wrong one day. And the technician was summoned, technicians arrive, technician does something under Tim's desk, and problem goes away. Problem goes away. And the computer is fixed. And the technician is leaving, and, and uh, Tim's PA said, uh, What was the problem? And the, uh, the technician just said, Picnic. They both uh, chuckled mysteriously at this one technician, and Tim was consumed. He wanted to know what picnic stood for, so he asked his, uh, he asked his PA, and, and slightly uh, shamefacedly, she said it stands for problem in chair, not in computer. Now, I, I think that's quite an interesting, sort of, quite sort of a, a nice sort of universal thing, or a variance of a problem between chair and computer, etc., and technicians having a laugh at the rest of this, which is fair enough. But that really is certainly my, my, my professional experience of this. You know, the, the problem, and I'm not being sniffy about this, the problem that is often in the chair because you know, it's people that add value, it's people that add meaning to, 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 to technical and socio-technical systems. But we screw up. We always screw up. And we screw up more uh, inadvertently uh, as well as carelessly when we work across boundaries. So problem in chair, not in computer. One of the sort of salutary lessons for me a number of years ago when I was seconded to the Home Office as a strategic analyst was Tony Blair, I think this was around 2002, um, stood up in Parliament and said, we will reduce, as a government, we will reduce street crime by, and it was a pretty heroic percentage figure that he then named, I can't really remember what it was, or I will resign in 12 months' time. Um, I think it was 17 or 18 hours later, I got a phone call from the Home Office saying, well, what do we mean by street crime? And, and the answer to that is A, we don't know, and B, there are different definitions depending on who you go to speak to. So I guess that's one of the things that I want to, uh, to, to chase. Um, language is, is, is a huge issue here. And that, you know, we attach meanings to words which we're very comfortable with, those around us are probably very comfortable with, but when you start reaching across quite complex multi-team systems and managing a crisis, other people may be completely comfortable with the language as well, but mean something completely different by it. Um, I work quite a lot, as was mentioned, in the, uh, the, 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 intro on the Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Programme, um, established following Lady Justice Hallett's um, coroner's uh, report into the, uh, the, the, the desk in the London bombings. And the ability, maybe say the relative inability of the emergency services to work effectively and normally together was one of the things that she investigated at length. 
Uh, and and one, of the, uh, one of the things that cropped up in the, uh, in, in the, in the review stage of the work was the, uh, the use of silent sticks or, uh, or light sticks. Um, so for the, um, for the ambulance service, as I understand it, certainly as it was related to us, um, in, a, uh, in the context of clearing a, a dark environment, the ambulance um, service would put a, a red silent stick on a, uh, a P1 or a P2 casualty, somebody uh, seriously injured requiring priority evacuation from that place. Um, the, uh, the military, not the police, um, but the military would use a silent stick to, to, uh, to indicate a potential improvised explosive device. So again, it's sort of one example of a similar, I'm not making light of this at all, it's one example of a, a something that means something no problem to one organization means something profoundly different. And slightly mysteriously, an MP in a comments debate on interoperability a few years ago had that to say. I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's fair at all uh, on, on, on any of the services mentioned. But the point is, it's, it's, it's out there, and the, the inability, the relative inability, or the friction of different emergency responder or crisis manager organizations to work effectively together is now recognized, and that's a good place to be. So you all know a lot about human factors. Chelsea, say you will know a great deal more about human factors than, than I do. Um, three, three books I've certainly found hugely useful in, in, uh, over the past few years. We've been variously published in probably the last four, three or four years. Um, Dan Carman's Thinking Fast and Slow is well known. But the one in the middle, Checklist Manifesto by, uh, by Atto Gawande, is certainly something I've found hugely, uh, hugely useful. Can I just have a show of hands? I'm always interested for different audiences how many people are aware of Atto Gawande's book. The Checklist Manifesto. Well, wow, okay. Really strongly, strongly recommended. It's a relatively, relatively short book. It's, it's a dead easy read. He's a general surgeon. He gave this year's wreath lectures for the BBC, actually. But he's a general surgeon in Boston um, at, at Harvard um, University, the, the, the Boston Hospitals, um, who got so frustrated by um, surgeons and medical teams making the same mistakes predictable um, mistakes, um, uh, preventable hospital deaths, I suppose, would be the, uh, the term for them. But he was the guy that, uh, that started the World Health Organization checklist, which started with relatively basic questions like, are you operating on the right person? Are you doing the right operation on the right person? Are you trying to remove the right bit or attach the right bit or whatever it might be? And, you know, do you have all of the people that are required to be in the team? Do they all know each other? You know, that those basic sort of conditions for effective teamwork and focusing on the right problem because his analysis was that we keep screwing up on the easy stuff and highly, highly competent individuals will still make stupid mistakes. So that was where they enshrined something that's well known and established in crew resource management in the aviation industry um, and actually translated it into the healthcare industry. And there's been a lot of work on human factors in healthcare including that sort of crew resource management stuff coming over from aviation in recent years. So I suppose if, so some of the sort of key interests in human factors are sort of how we think, how we behave, how we interact, the non-technical skills, not just whether you're sort of good at flying a plane. The old joke in aviation was in the 1970s, the two golden rules, one the captain was always right, the second golden rule was sea rule number one. You know, there was no sort of question of the crew interacting effectively or challenging each other as a team. It was, you do what the guy, sorry, you do what the guy in the left seat says, end of story. And of course this whole sort of emphasis on non-technical skills has, has, has really sort of disassembled that uh, and, and tried to put in place much, much more effective team working. But of course, whether it's in a, a cockpit in things going wrong or a crisis management team in a variety of different contexts, then it's not normal, easy, everyday business. Pace and tempo is high, uncertainty may be absolutely rampant, you really don't know what's going on. The consequences are high, maybe sort of existential for your organization as a whole. And this, of course, you know, pulls through in terms of stress reactions to individuals. And pe people obviously relate to, to stress in very different ways. So two things there that I, I find very, very useful. I love Larson cartoons. If you can't read that one, it's 2000 a cockpit sensei. What's a mountain goat doing way up here in a cloud bank? You know, nothing, nothing sort of, you know, new in, 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 in that. But of course, what they're demonstrating there is, uh, is, is, the, uh, is, is, is the preference for plausible and comfortable conclusions over dissonant ones. And there's a guy called James Snook 
who, um, who, in addition to having a, a fabulous name, is, uh, is, is a pilot in the US Air Force and did a PhD thesis a number of years ago, um, which he published as a book called Friendly Fire. Looks like an airport thriller. It's got a picture of a, a black hawk in, in crosshairs um, uh, looking as if it was about to crash. In actual fact, it's the summary of a PhD thesis. So, book plug number four, um, James Smith, Friendly Fire. And it's, it's, it's again a fairly accessible book. Um, but what he does is he basically looks at how a single event, which was the accidental shooting down of two U.S. Black Hawk helicopters over the northern no-fly zone of Iraq in, I think it was 2003, by another American aircraft, how it happened. And the general transferable conclusion that he reached was when any of us, especially under pressure, are looking at a piece of information, a conclusion, um, a situation more generally, we're constantly within our heads juggling three things. What we want to see, what we expect to see, and what we actually see. And of course, what happened in that particular context was that they expected to see Russian helicopters. They rearranged the evidence to suit that. This is all sort of cognitively in terms of sort of system one thinking. Um, they, uh, they sort of you know, got rid of some, some, some dissonant information like they didn't look like Russian helicopters um, and went ahead on their, their, their course of uh, tragic action. So thinking about thinking is, uh, is, is, a, uh, is, is a hugely uh, important part of this, actually understanding how our brains, um, our brains work. I mentioned my, my boss who left, the, uh, left from the army 10 years ago and he told me an absolutely brilliant story which was about six months into his post as a senior civil servant. He was interviewed by someone from Human Resources who was trying to find out how the senior civil service spent their days. And he was very happy to do this chatting. He, he spent uh, quite a long time on the phone saying, yeah, I do about 10% on this, 20% on this, 25% on this. And he reached a point where there was still 25% left over and he stopped. And the, uh, the researcher from Human Resources said, what do you spend the other 25% on? He said, think. And then there was this long, long pause. And the rather embarrassed researcher said, I haven't got a code for thinking. Now, I think that's a metaphor for the civil service, more, more generally. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's more generally transferable. We don't often think how we think individually, collectively, under pressure. But it is in actually better understanding ourselves that we can safeguard how we do make mistakes. So cognition is how we work internally. It's how we process information, how we reason, how we reach tentative conclusions, and how we then firm them up into uh, into informed conclusions. I think the sort of the, 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 the second one really to sort of uh, cover in terms of ideas is uh, is situational awareness. It's a bit of a sort of buzzword, I suppose. That would be my definition. The state of the I won't go through. You can read it. But certainly we, we, we do like simple in in, in training, um, and to us. Situation awareness is having a good, robust, best possible under difficult circumstances set of answers to three questions. What, so what, and what might. So you can unpack those slightly into, into what is, what's happened, what's happening now, what's being done about it. I'm very happy to, uh, I understand that the notes for this will go off the website, I'm very happy to elaborate on that in, in, in those notes. So what's happened, what's happening now, what's being done about it. Facts. Facts are pretty straightforward gets harder. So what is what might the implications of this be? Short term, medium term, long term, direct, indirect, systemic, cascading. It gets potentially real complicated once you start messing with infrastructure and socioeconomic systems. And the hardest one again, hence the, uh, the, 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 the picture is the forward look. The ability to project the situation forward in time to actually understand a number of different potential scenarios or outcomes for, for the crisis that you're actually dealing with. So situational awareness is not just facts of the situation now, it's actually got a strong analytic, so what, and forward look ability to project components to it. And the second and third are harder than the first one. But individual situational awareness is just what it says. It is an individual cognitive state reached by how we as individuals actually think our way through. So how do you go from individual situational awareness, you, 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 me, to shared situational awareness in the context of that team and multi-team system? Because that's how you manage crises. It's not just one person having all the great ideas, solving it, problem goes away. It's this huge distributed collective effort. So 
the predictable answer, otherwise I'll be shutting up and sitting down now, is no, it's, it's far from simple. Why? Right. First step is actually if you think about information flows. So we, we started off a few slides ago with that sort, of, that sort of very logical, rational process of how we manage information. We need it, we get it, we validate it, we do something with it, we do, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but that is a, really a hellishly complicated thing. So even if you just take a sort of a single slice of, uh, of information flows, very sort of schematically represented there, it's not just about the police service talking to the fire service and that's it. It's about lots of people talking to lots of other people and bearing in mind that it's across the boundaries that ambiguities, inconsistencies and meaning all creep in and meaning starts to fray that you can see immediately the problem. And for us in central government, of course, the issue is it's not just about, you know, at the fire ground or the incident ground or wherever it might be at the front line. There's this huge pyramid of information flows which ultimately end up into, uh, in, into COBRA for ministerial decision making where that is relevant. So, lots of uncertainty in the crisis. Jumping back to Atul Gawande's recommended book on uh, the Checklist Manifesto, 2010, where have the last five years gone? He, he distinguishes between two different types of, uh, of error, which I, I'm going to map onto two different types of uncertainty. The first step on the left-hand side is inherent uncertainty in a crisis. So in a crisis, whether it's a very sort of physical, local thing such as a train, a fire, stuck in a tunnel, casualties, you know, horrible, high stress, potentially tragic kind of circumstances, then there is very obviously a high level of inherent uncertainty in that. You cannot rapidly find out what train it is, how many people, how badly injured, how long it would take, all these kinds of things that senior people will want to know. So there's that inherent uncertainty in a crisis. And uh, Gawande terms those errors of ignorance. And I know it sounds slightly sort of sniffy and pejorative, but he doesn't mean it in that way at all. What I'm interested in is the stuff on the right-hand side, which is the kind of um, error that we either introduce, we exacerbate, or maybe we don't get rid of and, uh, and manage fast enough in, in, in a crisis. So it's uncertainty that arises or is complicated by the inability of organisations and people within them to, to really work coherently together. And Gawande marvellously calls these errors of ineptitude. I think that is pejorative, and rightly so. And certainly our experience in central government, and I don't try to extrapolate out too far from that, is there are four types or four sources for inherent, uh, sorry, for errors of ineptitude. One is doctrine and processes. Doctrine, funny word. It basically is codified guidance for how we work individually and collectively together and processes that are embedded within that. And if you don't have doctrine that combines organisations, that enables them to talk, to coordinate and to act coherently, then you can't act coherently when push comes to shove. So if you've got flawed doctrine or no doctrine, you're in a bad place. Cognition and biases. Um, certainly, if you, uh, you know, a huge amount has been written around weapons of mass destruction following the invasion of Iraq in 2006. What you want to see, what you expect to see, and what you actually see, and you know, if you think about the whole weapons of mass destruction thing, then certainly you know, those three overlapping circles tell a very powerful story about that. Cross-boundary working, I'll elaborate on that, and error. We all screw up from time to time. The trick is working in a team where people can catch it and where people will intercept it. We're back to picnic again. So, if we sort of drop back onto that nice, rational, logical, quite reassuring and comforting kind of process, then what I really want to zoom in a little bit on are those two sort of phases there, where we actually make some judgments about whether information is fit for purpose, and then we talk to other people about what we have found out. Does anybody know, I love this, does anybody know the backstory to this picture here? You probably need to be quite loud, but can you tell us the quick story about this one, please? <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm in the lands of words of two weeks. No, 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 I don't think so, sir. But you're absolutely right. It's the album of the the Welsh Translation Department. Um, Let's, let's just step up that it was embarrassing for the individuals and for the organisation concerned. 
So I think there's a, there's a much sort of bigger truth in this, which is moving information around is not gaining shared situation awareness. It is just moving information around. The real sort of trick is actually people engaging with the information and engaging with the information in such a way that they reach not just the intended uh, conclusion or right interpretation of it, but hopefully the correct one. So the sort of the metaphor that we keep going back to is, 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 is the chain, you know, the weakest link. Quite often I find in training and working with information sales and situation sales in government is, is people at relatively junior grades, they, ah, I'm just little cog, little cog, nothing, you know, it really doesn't matter if I screw up or knock off early. Yeah, it really does because in a broken chain, a supply chain of information from the sort of, you know, the boardroom to the storeroom or from the prime minister to a police constable, whatever you want to call it, each and every link in that um, operates. Pretty sure the chief executive of that local authority found it kind of embarrassing in a way that they really didn't expect to that morning. A couple of other sort of examples, uh, or a few other examples of, 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 of language here. Um, I, I, I make myself unpopular with the Met Office for using the, uh, the top example, but I don't stop. Um, because I'm not quite sure what that top one means. Um, Moving on, uh, uh, the, the, the other one which comes from a slightly more sort of um, sensitive uh, context, um, I watched two civil servants um, come up with this sentence, no word of a lie, they then high-fived each other. Now, we civil servants, we like a bit of wriggle room. We don't like to be actually sort of have to answer for what we write. This is being taped, isn't it? Forgot that. Um, anyway, the context is withheld, but the point there is, you know, Inserting, deliberately injecting ambiguity when you are trying to enable decision makers who are facing really high stakes decisions is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. If you don't know, the answer should be you don't know, not a paragraph which people have to grind through and so on. Probably the sort of the classic example of one word, multiple meanings with profound and tragic consequences related to the Bay of Pigs invasion um, in 1961. And this is um, from the, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, evaluation of the CIA plan to, uh, to invade that particular section of Cuba. What does fair chance actually mean? Well, there's two possible interpretations of what the words fair and chance put together mean. And obviously, if your history is uh, well, better than mine, um, it, it, it didn't go so well. It went kind of badly. The guy who wrote the assessment, one General Gray, when he was quizzed about it, and trying to avoid the interrogated word, when he was quizzed about it, uh, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant three in one chance against success. When President Kennedy, who had the executive authority and actually launched the invasion, was asked about it, he thought it meant a two and three chance of success. So, you know, there's your absolutely classic standout example of one word, profoundly different meanings, a gulf of understanding, one path of action that should probably never have taken place. Can I just ask you please to just think for a moment about these four words there, unlikely, probable, possible and likely. I've been asking uh, trainees in central government what these words mean to them for really quite a long period of time. Now what we don't have is the time to actually sort of quickly sort of uh, run, run through, but uh, run through the exercise. What are the mean values? I've got about sort of 700 um, points in a, uh, a, a spreadsheet. What's interesting is this, which is the range of values. So you could have somebody within COBRA talking about something being probable, and they're at about 95%, and a bunch of people listening to him or her who are arranged between 95% and 15%. So language is massively important, but because we know what it means to us, we assume it means the same thing to other people. A colleague of mine tells a very useful story, a salutary story of a situation report coming in during an exercise referring to a reservoir breach. She is from a military background. That thing down there is a reservoir breach to her mind. To the engineer who was reporting it, it meant something uh, more akin to that, that's the early reservoir in, two, uh, in 2007, which was a little bit of sloughing on the front wall of the Victorian Earth Dam. One meaning, two completely different, uh, sorry, one word, two completely different uh, meanings. 
I remember quizzing a, uh, a military officer on a, uh, I think it was a seven letter acronym, so I don't know what it is, but I can tell you what it does, which is grand, um, but it doesn't work across all contexts. And uh, just out of interest, the, uh, the Ministry of Defence acronyms and abbreviations in either 11 or 12 font area, single spaced A4, is 373 pages long. So the, our ability to actually get all on the same page when we litter things with acronyms. Okay, we are into areas of ineptitude here. Okay, so moving on. So what's the, what's the so what? Well, you know, statements are blindingly obvious, but you know, we make sense of information in ways that sense make trip myself up. We make sense of information in ways that make sense to us as individuals. And assuming that everybody's on the same page and has the tools, the techniques, the experience, the culture, the aptitude, aptitude the same level of risk appetite, the linguistic ability, all the rest of it. To agree with us, no, nah, you can't assume that. Information systems are not the same thing as information technology, um, and you know, we have a nasty habit of exacerbating uncertainty in the crisis. So what does better look like? Really just to sort of expose how we train people within central government with much more discerning customers. Um, you will remember the Fukushima nuclear emergency of uh, 2011. Um, one, uh, one morning, um, the situation cell in Cobra received a situation report update from a nameless government organization. In the body of the email were three letters, FYI, for your information. It, attached to it were four, were, were four attachments. Two of them were in Japanese. We didn't have anybody who spoke Japanese. Uh, and secondly, there was, uh, there was sort of uh, a single sort of uh, single, single page PDFs of what I just described as hardcore nuclear engineering data. We could not make sense of it. You're back to your Welsh language translation. Simply moving information around is not building shared situational awareness. It's just moving information around. So, you know, the, the metaphor analogy that I would use is, you know, you'd be a bit cheesed off if you're not going to tell you if you ordered the pizza, you open your door and you've got all the ingredients sat on your doorstep. So this idea of supply chain for us in government is a really, really valuable metaphor because every single person should be adding value where they're competent to do so. Simply just going, can't be bothered, and bunging it up the chain or down the chain or sideways is absolutely unacceptable. And there's this whole bunch of sort of quite technical, but technical sort of uh, stuff in, in the background here, which I won't go into. But they're, in a sense, the classic criteria for information assessment: what constitutes good. And Mark Lee and myself from the Emergency Planning College have written about this, and something that's available on the uh, on the EP College website. So we come back really to, to interoperability. We're going to sort of uh, wind wind this up now. And interoperability, certainly the research that I've been doing over the past few years, has suggested that the things that enable good communication to build shared situational awareness apply pretty much equally in contexts like that, very frontline, uh, physical, potentially quite high-risk environments, right the way through to national crisis decision-making in COBRA. And that's the definition of interoperability which we arrived at a number of years ago. And I described a little bit earlier on about for my boss, when he came out of the army, he would have rejected it, he would have torn that up. But he and I developed that a couple of years ago. Um, the extent to which organizations can work together coherently is a matter of routine. And that is the real trick, is actually normalizing cross-border and cross-boundary working in such a way that you develop a series of good habits. And uh, a, a hanging tag on the doors of one of the NATO interoperability sections in NATO HQ actually just reads interoperability as a state of mind. And I think that's actually quite powerful. It's actually attitudinal. And certainly one of the things that I try to leave people with when we do training in government is Carl Sagan's point, there's no such thing as a stupid question. If you don't know, ask. I'm going to jump over, over that one. So, we've described many of the sort of the, uh, the, the, the balance and so on to, uh, to attaining shared situation awareness, and I've used language as probably the easiest way to, to illustrate that. So we've got individual situation awareness, what so what, what might. Um, we've got some sort of parallel between, over, we've got some parallel between COBRA and uh, an individual um, sort of local emergency response. But how do you move from individual 
I've got all of the answers, I know that you don't have all of the answers, you've got some of the answers to shared situation awareness. And you know, it's essentially about contributing, it's about reflection, but critically it's about challenge. And so many of the good habits that we try to, uh, to, to, to instill in people in government are the simple things like if you're not sure um, what somebody means, ask. If you don't know what their baseline, their denominator is, what metrics they're using, ask. If you think that they're using highly technical terminology and you don't have the conceptual understanding, don't let them get away with it because you, along with that supply chain, will have to pass it further up the chain. So people contribute, people reflect, but critically people challenge each other. So what this is very much sort of moving towards is it's not about you build situation awareness by managing information. Managing information is vital, but the critical stuff comes when people are actually interacting with each other. So it's about knowledge exchange as a form of conversation between willing participants who are prepared to challenge and prepared to be challenged rather than there's information crack on unfinished here, which is attitudinally absolutely inappropriate. So I sort of use the, uh, the idea, sort of, uh, I suppose, the visual metaphor of, uh, of, of, of a ladder really just winding, uh, winding this up. And certainly this is our analysis of the situation as to the things that really you've got to get nailed if you are going to have a decent stab at building not just lots of people with individual situation awareness, but actually shared situation awareness amongst the group that have to make some pretty tough decisions in a crisis. And first up is concepts. If you've got a bunch of people who don't understand you know, radiation as a concept, or risk as a concept, or you know, some of the fundamental concepts on which this whole thing is based, then you're not going to move towards a common understanding. Terminology. We don't all have to use the same language, but we have to know how to understand each other. Expertise, the degree to which we're, we're, we're deploying that effectively, my supply chain analogy. Um, procedures are vital, but let's not uh, think that they're, they're the only so. Objectives are people actually trying to achieve the same thing, um, which is clearly vital in joint operations. Assumptions. Um, we have to make assumptions. Very often they're wrong, um, but um, you know, it's, it's one of the, uh, the, the ideas with assumptions that once they're hidden, they sort of disappear beneath the waterline, then we all take them for granted. Um, but then they're very dangerous. Um, baseline metrics, what does normal look like? Um, and only at that point, once you've actually got some sort of you know, lubricated, uh, effective joint working, so we're actually getting on the same page with all of those, can you actually start thinking about a common operating picture, which is how to display it to individuals to represent it. But the idea of challenge is absolutely vital, and that's the thing that we try to instill in people. Pay grade doesn't matter. It's if you think somebody is barking up the wrong tree, then you absolutely have got to challenge them. Something that was attributed to, uh, to Eisenhower. If you've got a bunch of people in a room and they're all agreeing with each other, then at least one of them isn't thinking. So this idea of challenge is absolutely vital. Um, there is, in tiny, tiny, tiny um, text, not even uh, readable at all, is a little checklist that we've, uh, we've developed, uh, and I'll be very happy to supply it to go onto the, uh, the website. But it, it provides a series of handrails and questions which people can use to challenge their own understanding, challenge the evidence that they're working on, and challenge the interaction across boundaries. So it's self-awareness of how you're thinking, it's a rigorous approach to the evidence, bearing in mind that a lot of it will be wrong. That can't freeze you. You've got to deal with it. But it's critically also about enabling people to have, well, I think it was mentioned earlier on, difficult conversations with each other about what you know, what you don't know, and all of the rest of it. So sort of a few end notes for me. For me. Um, common and shared are good words. They're nice words. They're comforting words. They're very, very important words. Um, but to actually reach either a shared understanding or a common operating picture, then I think a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking it's pure and simple about moving data and information around. That's the base layer, that's the way you go in, but actually how you add meaning to that is where people are challenging each other, having conversations, sharing knowledge, sharing insights, and also, well, as I said at the start, actually sort of challenge, challenging each other. Um, 
I, and I think where interoperability, especially between the emergency services, but between organisations more generally, has actually gone as a bit of a journey, is, is, is really quite telling. It's gone from being computers talking to computers, kit talking to other bits of kit, well that would look like I'm not entirely sure, to actually the users, you know, the, actually turning problem and churn not in computer around by 90 degrees and accepting that the real value is not just the computer to computer stuff, it's actually the human interaction. It's always a little bit cheap to finish something with somebody else's words, but I offer them because they sort of stuck with me on a work on this over the past 10 or so years. Uh, and so that's where we do finish crisis management training in, uh, in, in government. I'm particularly sort of uh, fond of the, uh, the ones at the bottom there. Failure is not an option. They're very sort of gung-ho. Um, title of the book by Gene Krantz, the flight director for the Apollo 13 mission, which obviously was a, uh, uh, an interceptor failure, as it were. Uh, and Sidney Decker, the Australian research into human systems, uh, who sort of uh, uh, very cleverly argued, failure is always an option. So I'm going to leave it there, but if there are any questions, I'd be delighted to, to, to tell them. It's totally context dependent. Um, I, was, I was briefing a, uh, a, a, a bunch of embassies delegates on crisis management readiness and facilities earlier on, and their, their most burning question um, was, uh, I could got the surround by screens, what, what can we put on the screens? And they seem to be operating on, on a premise that I could get the news on and I could get some helmet cam footage on that one. And, and it's absolutely true, you can do all of these things, but it doesn't necessarily make it right. So I still remind them of a, of, of a saying in the UK Fire Service, which is chaos, which stands for chief has arrived on scene and chaos ensues. And it's that idea that if the person who has strategic oversight is not maintaining strategic oversight, they're fiddling around the operational details, then nobody is upstairs taking oversight of the whole thing. So in terms of sort of crowdsourced data or monitoring social media, etc., it's absolutely vital that at the national strategic level, which is the sort of work where, where our training takes place, then extracting out, not the sort of the high tempo change, but extracting out that does it fundamentally change the strategic picture? At that point, you extract the relevant stuff out. So, Certainly, crowdsourced data, um, you know, sort of pattern analysis in in in, um, in in social media is an increasingly powerful tool than policing and intelligence and so on. Um, but it's one that we dip sample where it has strategic significance only. Hello, uh, Toby Hello. Clark. Um, Basically, a little advertisement, I, I've written a little book called Disaster and Emergency Management Systems. It's only $10, you can buy it on Amazon. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. I, I'm going to double plug that, I'm going to retweet that. What is it? Disaster and Emergency Systems. Yeah. Oh, you're still Thank you very much, Andy. Okay. Yeah, I, your point about systems is, 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 you know, systems analysis and systems of systems is, is a really powerful way of, of, of looking at this. Not just how can we make this bigger and more complicated, but understanding the, where some of those links go wrong as well. So, Someone, just there. Thanks. Uh, I mean, when it comes down to the emergency response management and uh, setting up of uh, operations, yeah. when, when we talk about commercial organizations, uh, about uh, work for one, uh, we do not have a specific uh, emergency response teams, but again, you would have accountants, engineers, etc., who will double up as members of an emergency response team. Uh -huh. So do you think that, uh, I mean, Having a process in place, something like an incident command system, which is an American-based system, which is scalable, so that, do you think having a process enables uh, people, uh, I mean, who's, I mean, it's not the major basically to be uh, an emergency responder, but they just jump in, 
So do you think that uh, having a process in place uh, would really help in teaching people uh, who do different things as a day job, basically you can just be pulled in at any time to respond to a crisis? Uh, the oh, wrong one. Oh, problem channel on computer. Um, the, the simple answer would be yes. If 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 you are um, hoping, well, one of the recurrent problems, and I'll emphasize the word recurrent. I.e., it's something that we find as public sector as well as private sector just hard to get right. Is ambiguity about roles and responsibilities. So people not knowing what they're to do, people not knowing what other people are do, to do, people not knowing what other people are expecting of them, and other people not knowing what they can contribute to them. So that sort of uncertainty about roles and responsibilities is absolutely bang in the middle of sort of areas of ineptitude. So you've absolutely got to have, you know, people know under certain specified circumstances what they will be doing and how they will interface with other people. And that is very much what I would sort of, you know, call the uh, well, I've called it procedures or, or the doctrine layer in, in, in that one. So that's absolutely vital. What's, what's hugely important on top of that is making it real. Um, a, a, um, a, a colleague of mine from, from the private sector has got his, his global resilience director for a huge multinational organisation has described this in terms of getting this kind of stuff into the DNA of the organisation. And I think that's a really powerful metaphor because his point in using that metaphor is I don't want people when a crisis happens to reach for the plan and go through the ring binder 278 hours here somewhere but they actually know here in my phone, that, that, that they know what to do. They know the right thing to do. They know, they know I'm just going to go left and right, it works for you. Um, you know, left and right of them, top and down, what other people are doing and how it all meshes in. And you don't just reach that by writing it down. The, the training component is absolutely vital. The exercising component is absolutely vital. And organizations that are really serious about this will go from training and exercising into validation. So actually stress testing to know whether they're up to it. That gets progressively harder in small to medium sized enterprises. Um, but certainly for big organizations, it's, it's, it's again, it's another sort of US military, you know, to hope is not a method. Um, you've got to take this really quite, quite seriously. But getting organizations to really invest in this from the top of the shop is a very hard thing to do. We know that because there are opportunity costs. If I'm training you on this, you're not out there earning me some money. Uh, well, we know how to, to, to argue back against that, but uh, hopefully that's a reasonable answer. Quite a simple question. Do you think we're getting there? Um, obviously, some years ago, all the emergency services were operating on their own. We've had quite a few incidents where they've had to work together. Yes. Are we going to work together? Have we got a long way to go or have we got a small way to go? Um, yes, we are getting there. I, I think this Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Programme, which the Home Secretary massively invested politically in and drove really quite relentlessly, um, has had a, a tremendous effect. And I was certainly looking at the, uh, the, the, the Twitter feed of, of, of Jessup earlier on today, and there's lots of examples, you know, where there's sort of road traffic collisions or, you know, railway incidents or what have you, where you've got, you know, the stuff that we enshrined in doctrine has been promulgated through training is actually happening. So I, I, I think I'm not an optimist by heart, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, um, but I, I absolutely think that, that there's, there's real progress there. But there's got to be a healthy one to that, which is, if you get complacent about this, you're heading for a bad place really quickly. So we can't put this in the box marked sorted. We're going to worry about something else now. You know, it's, it's one of the, the work that we've done on resilience more broadly. Absolutely rejects the idea that any organisation or collective can be resilient as an absolute state. You can't be. You can be more, but as the world changes, you've got to keep moving. It's the conveyor belt idea. So yeah, I think we are in a much better place than we were five, six, seven, eight years ago without a shadow of doubt that complacency would be a, would be a, 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 a terrible turn of events for all to get all comfortable in themselves, I think. I, I, I think that goes for just my new organisation. Um, yeah, 
the, the, the overarching principles for us in central government um, are the same that the crisis emerges from uh, a threat, which would be malicious intent, terrorism being the main plank of that, or natural, uh, you know, sort of naturally occurring emergencies, you know, health emergencies, industrial accidents, um, or, or, or things like that. Um, coherence. And going back to the point about roles and responsibilities, bear in mind that our staff sort of move around between jobs quite a lot. So the core doctrine, what you do in a crisis, is, 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 is much more similar rather than it's different depending on context. Plus one of the things that uh, in central government, one of our sort of principles is consequences, not causes, should be the prime effect, uh, prime focus in the crisis. And, and that drives you into a common way of working. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Rob. And uh, I think what are we 